Hey and welcome to this weekend's uh, episode of Co-Creating with AI. I'm Martin and with me as always is my co-host Rasmus. How are you today, Rasmus? I'm great. Um, yeah, had a really nice morning with my daughter as always. We've got a good routine and uh, yeah, this has been a really exciting week uh, at work as well. So yeah, all good and moving to a new house. Slept the first few nights there, soon ready to move permanently, which is going to be amazing, especially before the Swedish summer. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm um, I'm fasting and I'm uh, tormented by the smell of really good egg sandwiches from the kitchen. <laughs> so the kids are making fried egg sandwiches, and and uh, I feel my fasting is in danger. Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll see. Um, that's but, almost like you know, like the, the the like having someone fasting around you when you're not. It's almost like you know you want to tease them. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. It's I don't know. <laughs> Anyhow, back to back to this. Yes. Yeah. So um, we're going to talk about co-creating with AI as always. What are you thinking about today in this on this topic? Well, I think uh, I, I loved last week's episode. You know, lifting the gaze, looking ahead. You know, sharing a bit of the way we see the future uh, within this topic. You know, people co-creating together. Um, with each other and, and AI. Um, but I think today it would be really fun to sort of take it closer to home. Like really right now, what is this uh, all about right now, co-creating with AI? So maybe I can share a few, few thoughts on like how I'm thinking about it and maybe take some examples. Um, you up for that? Yes. Sounds yeah? awesome. Okay, yeah. let's do it. So I think it's pretty interesting just looking at... Um, the capability, first of all, of these new models. Uh, like, really, if you look at it, what they can do, uh, given the level of intelligence of, say, GPT-4, or the good image models, and of course, with other modalities, then the um, like the capabilities there to essentially um, do all repetitive knowledge work, anything that you, you as a person can do on a computer that is repeatable, um, can be done now better, faster, cheaper by AI. Uh, but that's like the capability layer. Uh, if I look at my own life, and and you know, there's really good research on this. Uh, you know, most people spend several hours a day on repetitive work. You know, collecting data from here and there, finding the right thing, and using that data to uh, produce some other type of content. Because I mean, knowledge work is essentially taking knowledge data in your in your own experience and mind or on the computer and transforming some kind of content. And that's, you know, generalized, whether that's a product plan based on user interviews or that's, you know, writing an article or that is writing a personalized sales email or that's writing a book or that's, you know, let's take something else. Uh, that's uh, doing the financial planning. It's still taking data or knowledge and transforming that in, in some way into some other form of content. Um, and why do I say that? Well, I mean, it's interesting then, like, if you look at the state of current AI models, in, in my view, uh, the way I like to phrase it is that they are assistants. And I think there's a very specific meaning to that for me. It's that, you know, you have to tell it what to do every time in one of actions. So if you want to use ChatGPT, Bard, even, you know, Notion AI, the way they implemented it, the way Microsoft is rolling out Copilot, it's still like, do this for me now. Summarize this, lengthen this, produce this content, then do this. And uh, and then there's also a lot of copy-pasting in most of these tools, yeah, like, you know, learning which prompts to use, how to use them, copy-pasting that in there, copy-paste the content from there to wherever you're actually doing your work, um, you know, from ChatGPT, if I take that, for example. So I think that's the kind of general frame I look at the state of AI today. And, and the way I think it, you know, obviously should work, and here I'll take, you know, Multiply that we're building as an example, uh, is that it should, you know, help you really automate repetitive work in a very easy way. Um, and I think I don't like before, or if we should go there, like actually talking about um, how we do it, I think it's just nice to categorize that there are broadly two topics in my view of, um, or maybe three actually, but two main topics in terms of individual work of, of knowledge work, which is organizing things. And I would even put like, I will use these two topics. I will even use like collaborate, put collaboration in there. 
hmm. syncing, aligning, finding right information, putting it in the right place, utilizing it for the right yeah. purpose. Yes, yeah. definitely. Um, and then the other one is creating, taking that knowledge, that data, and producing that content. So organizing and creating. That's at least my frame of it, um, which also ties back, uh, of course, to what I started. Um, does that relate with you, Martin? Do you think that's like a good description or do you like want to add some nuance or other perspectives to it? Yeah, so uh, now you uh, uh, defined organizing much more than creating. I think there are lots of aspects of creating as well. Uh, but uh, uh, I haven't thought through if there would be a, a, a third um, like part of of, uh, of knowledge work. I mean, communication uh, or building relationships or um, stuff like that is also perhaps part of it, but, uh, but, um, I think those, those two categories are, are definitely, um, separate, separate, uh, in, in what you're doing or how you're actually like shaping, uh, your output. If you're creating something new, it's, uh, it's a, it's a task where, where you are basing, uh, you're, you're creating, <laughs> yeah, you're basically creating something new out of, uh, out of uh, uh, previous knowledge, previous data, but uh, uh, that then needs to be organized and, and created. So that's how we build workflows. I also think like that, that's a good point. And I think you pointed out something that I wasn't completely clear about. Maybe those two categories, in my view, are, are things that um, are part of repetitive work. And I'm not saying all creative effort, not at all, right? All creative yeah. works that, but relationship building, not repetitive. Uh, in my view, at least, I mean, you could argue, you know, sales, it's repetitive, but that's not really relationship building when it is uh, like, not really. So those are two categories of, of repetitive work that can be automated with AI at the current capability level of these models. Maybe you could envision a future where, where the others can as well, but I, I find it hard to imagine that, you know, um, at least at this point. Mm. Mm. All right, but yeah. So and and also like um, like I know like when we we chatted uh, I was like this week like the concept of um, of like how to work with AI. What's a good interface? Uh, yes. what, what are your thoughts around that? Yeah. So uh, what we're seeing right now, the, and with the advent of ChatGPT and a lot of other services, that is that the primary mode for talking to AI is through a chat interface, and it's. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, the the completion models, um, Da Vinci and uh, which which is GPT three, uh, were tricky to use because you have to really be knowledgeable about how to set up uh, the prompt in order to get a good result. But when they fine tuned um, uh, the, the models into a chat interface uh, and chat completion, that means that. Um, there is a social protocol in place where the, the AI have learned that protocol and humans know it so that we can we can meet on common ground, so to, so to speak. And there's no threshold. And that's that's what made um, AI explode into the mainstream uh, of the winter. That uh, uh, it's so familiar, like humans became familiar to AI and AI became to, familiar to humans. And but then again, um, for business use or for creative use, what we what what is happening is that people are sort of looking at the chat interface and say, "So this is cool and all, but what do I do with this? How do I create from this?" And then the threshold becomes there there in the second step instead, and uh, so that's where we are now. And I think there is a, a huge amount of innovation going on in UI, um, but we are. It, it's it's still AI and generative AI is still um, in many people's minds and not only in users' minds, but also in product uh, designers and product developers' minds. AI, generative AI is, is about putting text in text boxes. And that's a very limiting way of looking at AI because it can actually do both of those tasks that you are talking about, the organization part and the creation part. Yeah, and I think that's really interesting, like just on the last point, like in, in that it's also, of course, you can't organize your work through a chat interface. 
that I mean that's that just comes without saying almost. exactly yeah and um, and uh, and uh, creating something like we have developed we've spent decades developing UI for creating things like Figma for creating um, websites and Photoshop for for editing pixels and and uh, and then Word and Excel and there's so many different interfaces for different modalities different structures of data and what you're creating and and the chat interface maps very badly to all of those and so as a user like i have to be very inventive in how i bridge that and copy pasting is like the first step and but where do you go what what is the second step how do i get my ai to manipulate my vectors in figma or or structure my data into a database that's um or like structure cells in a in a, in a spreadsheet yeah that's, and i think that's, that's really impossible. interesting yeah and and also like just taking because i think it's important to say for example you know, adobe uh, was it firefly they called it their new one yeah. um then they actually have like a ux type point and click and drag type of interactions to make the ai do things yeah. so i think it's really happening in the implementation in in like the highly specialized tools in some ways. However, what I think is so interesting is it's still an assistant. It's still like, you know, even in the, in the way Adobe Firefly works, it's like, it's almost like just a, a more capable UX. They could also just have a brush and maybe that's how they have it. Like that, um, you know, removed blur from wherever you drew it, like, and, and which mm. is one of the applications that I've, I've seen or fills out, you know, uh, but still, you have to tell it to do every step of the way. Um, and you're not going to be able to take, say, a repetitive design process, which is taking some type of picture and performing some types of set of, of, of actions on it. At least I haven't seen that yet uh, to produce a desired result such that, for example, if you are a designer or a uh, photograph, no, sorry, what do you call it? Uh, not a photograph. What do you do? What, who's the person who take photos professionally? A photographer. Photographer. There we go. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, taking the the images from your photo shoot, automatically yeah. finding uh, the best ones, which is something you're f- very familiar with from narrative, mm-hmm. right? Which you guys built very early, and and then performing a set of actions to to get them uh, to a good state and, and maybe even publish them. There, like there, there's something there that's still on the assistant level for me, but I I think there's also some innovation in especially the interfaces that are already really good for something specific in implementing AI. Um, but yeah, I think like mostly also, I think it's, it's almost like a, a zeitgeist, right? ChatGPT caught the zeitgeist of AI. Mm. Like there, there is a, there, there will always be a pre-ChatGPT and a post-ChatGPT when you look back at the history of the world, in my opinion. It will mm. be a significant moment. Um, but what's interesting, I think, when you capture a zeitgeist is you also um, shape the zeitgeist and mm-hmm. chat yeah. caught the imagination and i think has at, i would say for everyone but for a lot of people i think uh fixed it in that yes ai is something you chat with um you know that's how you work with it yeah. and of course that's not a very autonomous and that's like the real kind of differentiation we're going for right mm-hmm. it's like from assistant to like from a non like a non-autonomous assistant to an autonomous coworker inside yeah. inside multiplier of course um but yeah there's also something like uh, i want to give a shout out to the for the video you sent me with um by rachel woods who's an awesome ai influencer uh, that we'd love to chat with if you if you uh, see this we'll, we'll send you the link um about like the value of like how you work best with these uh, like ai models in terms of chaining etc do you, do you want to mm-hmm. speak about that or did or are you on some other thing yeah no so um, um in developing multiply i can just uh, touch on that like how how we think about multiplies ui maybe I, we can we can that's a good lead into talking about um chain chain prompting and so on uh, because um um the ui in multiply is specialized in terms of yes you you can write text but can you, you can also organize content it's a it's a and data lives on a graph and you can form relationships between data items and you can build hierarchies and and, and trees and and like star shaped data in that in that graph and uh, 
um, th that maps to how the human brain works, like how we think about organization. That's why mind maps are are uh, great for brainstorming and thinking and organizing um, whatever you whatever you have um, on your mind. And uh, so, in Multiply AI can help you build the structure, build um, both templates for how structure should work, and and also. Um, and then then fill out that structure when you're creating content. So we have that um, those modalities that you talked about initially, organizing data and and then creating. And um, um, for for um, for multiply, we we use a, a like a block editor paradigm, which is um, fairly fairly common. But it allows the AI and the human to co-create on on a um, on a new level where it's not a, it's not a chat, but we're still um, um, working on the same document, and and that's a so it, it is a very different paradigm where we have optimized um, the the user experience to be great for both the AI and for the human in working on that document, and and uh, the same in the same. Document view lives both the structure of the of the content and the content itself, so it's a it's a high low optimized experience and it's optimized for the the, the co creation between between human and AI, and the way the one of the strengths of that of that user interface is that prompting AI works so much better if you chain um, a few prompts instead of just relying on writing run one single strong prompt. <clears throat> and this is something that, that for example, Rachel Wolves that you described, people are just, people are finding out and and uh, new tools are required in order to really realize the strengths of that. But but uh, it's also happening in the world of just copy pasting and solving repetitive tasks with a with a chat interface. It then it becomes a lot of copy pasting and you're like I often feel myself when I'm not using Multiply, I feel myself being reduced to a copy and paste monkey. But uh, um, and that's not that's not my my ultimate purpose with using AI. <laughs> that to reduce myself into into more mechanical work than before. Uh, so that's why it's 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 great to have a, um, an interface like Multiply where uh, the UI is, is uh, geared towards that. Um, so what happens when you chain a prompt is that you can instruct the AI first, like think about this first, and uh, and then when you have that result, use that result in a second step, and then use the the, the second step uh, result in a third step. And if you think about it, that's that a lot of education deals um, deals with how to how to allow humans to learn good processes. In maths and and uh, and, uh, and basically all of all of STEM engineering and uh, biology, in order to understand processes that exist in the physical world, we we work in a step by step way, and that's why it's so powerful also to to instruct the AI to work in a step by step way. It's very interesting, actually. Just a couple of things that came up to me, like when you were talking. The first is just like the nature of how we built multiply is very closely aligned to the brain. And I think it's like what you said is like, for me, very like, I know this is like kind of rough, scientifically speaking, but you know, it's right brain. It's associative. It's linking things. Memory is associative as well. Um, but then you also have the left brain, which is structure, labels, hierarchy, and Maybe a third thing, I think it sort of fits in the left brain, but it's worth mentioning separately is what you just said, which is process, which is like almost like the the act of learning how to do something is taking that left and right brain memory, that structured label data on a graph, an associative graph, and using that to inform process. How do I ride a bike based on that what I've learned about the different aspects of it? Oh, right, I need to keep my hands there. I need to, you know, keep my balance, um, 
etc. I'm watching this in real time with my daughter as mm-hmm. she's, she's learning, which is really beautiful. Um, so that's just something that I, I thought about that, that's very like aligned with kind of the flexibility we built into this, which is um, I always pitch like when I, when I pitch Multiply, I'm like, we've done three things that are unique uh, in combination, especially. It's we have this flexibility to express pretty much uh, any type of app uh, or, or workflow, uh, repetitive workflow. And then the second thing is it's all linked on a global graph so anyone can work with each other and anything can be interlinked, which has these benefits, right? And then we make that automatically available for AI through extremely clever prompt construction and soon using embeddings. Uh, But that third thing is actually that the AI can understand what you want to do without you telling it Mm. because everything has purpose and context semantically. So this is an article with an introduction, a body conclusion, a summary, and a header image. And the AI understands that, and it understands the, the article about this. It understands that uh, the article is part of your research project, right, with that data. Mm. So it's like, it, it's very, very clever in that sense to capture these uh, three parts of it. And uh, um, the last thing I think is like, just to visualize it, that's why we have like, uh, to visualize like how that, interface works like we have an we have an internal app store called the multiply ai app store Mm. patent pending um that um, where basically it's just like one click to install and then you have a set of interlinked like what we call tags and attributes but like basically it's just a structure linked together of different like things you know it could be it can be like for example when we publish this podcast pro we we just take the transcript and it generates an episode description and image for uh, that we use for the podcast platforms then it extracts the key topics and creates a social boost uh, across all the social platforms for each of them based on our actual conversation hmm. so it's not like oh just making up some random shitty thing it's actually take what we talked about and it's going to write that then it's going to create a re- gener- uh, relevant image prompt for that specific topic, generate an image, which we can use then to publish on social media. Uh, so it's, it's, it's that kind of like, that I believe really is needed to bring this superpower of AI to everyone's life, both privately and at work, both individually and together. It's like making it that simple to take part of your work, part of the stuff that you don't, you know, need to do every day, the repetitive stuff. Uh, that that you can like with one click basically start automating, um, and there the chained prompts are uh, applied because uh, that's that's how we get such good results. Is that the uh, episode description is informed by the transcript, the topics are informed by the transcript and the episode description, which has already captured the most important things. Mm. Um, the uh, the social boost is is based on all of that. Uh, plus, it starts then generating maybe first a LinkedIn post, uh, and then a tweet, and then an Instagram post, etc. And then it generates an image that fits them all. Uh, so it's like that iterative process as well. I think it's very deeply in like what you say, like in, in terms of education and learning. Like iterating on something gives a better result. Making something first, learning from it, doing something else. Mm. That's the power of chain prompts in essence, in my opinion. Maybe there's there's probably other aspects, but that's like what what really speaks to me my current level of understanding yeah uh, and just like how intelligence works right how learning works yeah and and for a right brain person if you see the resulting structure as a as a as a spreadsheet uh like with with rows and columns uh or if you're a left brain person and and uh uh, sorry sorry i think it's the opposite like the the right brain person would would think about it as a graph like an associative graph uh, like a mind map while the left brain um, person is more of, more of a of a the spreadsheet um, mind perhaps, but no matter if it's a spreadsheet or a graph, imagine having to first like describe that graph and spreadsheet that you imagine in uh, in a chat. Like, okay, I want you to write a, an an article on this topic, and can you please start with this uh, with the subject, and then move on to the do- topic, and then con- a conclusion, and then um, by the way, I also want a social boost with uh, with LinkedIn and blog <laughs> yeah. posts and so on. And you describe that all of that in a chat interface, and you get the result uh, that that is uh, very unstructured. And then you have to map it back to the structure. And that that, that as an example really speaks to why um, the UI uh, enables the the co creation on on 
on so many levels is it's not only uh, that you can co-create in the same interface in the same document and and uh, create hierarchical content together it's also that just the communication is so tedious in a chat and and it's like you have no uh, um, tools at all uh, if you're only if your only tool is a conversation then you're just sit, sitting there talking to the AI and and basically all the work is still left uh, on the human to, to perform. Yeah, it's, it's, I, uh, yeah, I agree. I also had like just an interesting <laughs> observation of myself for our product plan is when I think about the evolution of our UI, um, I always think, you know, tables, Kanban boards, calendars, but mm-hmm. I think like left brain person, right? Yeah. I think we need to really prioritize the right brain. I mean, people as well. I wonder what that will be. Like, uh, like if you just prioritize the associative aspects of it, I mean, I can just mm. imagine like labels, you know, this, these are articles that are linked to this. I mean, the graph use of, of tools in our space are so shit generally, uh, but I think there's some real innovation to be done there. Uh, I mean, I guess the, ca- the, the, um, what do you call it? The, the whiteboard is mm. the, the predominant one, but there, there should be something interesting there to explore. Um, Mm, then I had something else that I that came away from me with what you said, but now I lost it. <laughs> Let's see if it comes back. <laughs> Maybe some other time. So, yeah, exactly. um, uh, so uh, what we've talked about now is how UI uh, definitely can be optimized for AI human interaction. We talked about chain prompts and the strength of that, and and also why why multiply works as as it does, where where the interface we built really um, assists both um, um, repetitive workflows, but also um, a, a new learning paradigm uh, where where uh, AI can create create uh, content that humans can learn from in a great way. Um, but but all this also f- just for communication that that and and uh, in multiply everything can be written created by by humans or by ai including the structure and that was actually what i was going to say like that's my definition of ai native by the way and i would come back to me what i want yeah. to say but i would just want to say that's my definition of ai native is that anything in the product can be done by both ai and people that's like but i don't know if that's a good but that's that's my latest definition sorry for interrupting i just want to say like i really really agree with that that's such an important important point yes and uh and so I, I think there are a lot of uh, aspects to dive deeper into here, but uh, uh, I, I think we are. It's time to round off, and yeah. uh, and this uh, this episode has been very much a, like a stream of consciousness kind of uh, um, episode. But I think that's a lot of fun as well uh, to just explore yeah. what is top top of mind for us right now. No, I agree. I just want to add, like, I came back to what I wanted to say, yeah. like on the topic yeah. of AI native and and the insights you shared is that I roughly categorize, if I just look from like a, I guess a, a business standpoint or like a product standpoint, that there are roughly three categories of, of uh, opportunities within the AI space. And the first one is kind of the foundational layer, foundational models and infrastructure. I would categorize Langchain, et cetera, there, like mm-hmm. infrastructure, DevOps, like the, the dev tooling, like that kind of thing. Um, and then you have the current products that already have existing distribution. And Microsoft, you know, uh, of course, Google, huge, are going to, Apple are going to implement in their products, you know, the power of these LLMs in, in many ways. So we talked about that before. But the third one is that actually a lot of these products can be reimagined. And mm. I do not believe that generally uh, there will be like the, the products with existing distribution that does that. Mm. I think there is like AI native. Uh, will be a term, or I don't know if it's that term, but that concept will be something that you see as the third category. And of course, you're already seeing emerging, but like really rethinking the UI, the UX uh, for this new world of AI, where, you know, people and AI can Uh, (laughs) co-create. Anyhow, last thoughts for me. Do you have any last ones? Otherwise, I'm I'm, I'm ranting off. No, I think that was a good closing point. And... uh... We can talk. We can talk more about uh, 
um, AI native apps in upcoming episodes. It would be fun to to explore actually, like what what that could be if we if we can envision a lot of other use cases for uh, human AI co creation than what Multiply represents. No, I agree. And actually, yeah. I thought about this in the beginning of the episode that I think it's time to start bringing other people into the podcast. Yeah, it would be maybe. fun. Like, yeah. it would be really fun. Like, maybe yeah. we should try it for next week. I have one person in mind who's already like keen. Um, cool. But uh, but let's see. Let's talk. Yes. Awesome. And thank you to the listener for being with us uh, all the way to the end of the episode. And uh, um, this has been a co-creating with AI episode. And you can find us um, uh, as, as well uh, on email if you want to reach us. I'm martin at multiply.co and Rasmus is rasmus at multiply.co. Email us if you want to send over some questions or ideas for future topics to talk about. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Martin.